It's Joe Pyre from the Ladies Working Dog Group. Are you feeling stuck with your gun dog training? Trust me, you're not alone and that's exactly why you need to be here. Every week we we'll bring you the best tips and hacks to make training your gun dog easy peasy. We'll keep it straightforward, no fuss, just actionable guidance that you can put straight to use. So let's get started. Hello and welcome to another episode of Found It Fetched It. Before we begin this week's podcast, I'd love to say a big thank you to all of you who are are downloading and enjoying our episodes where you've taken us to the top of the charts in uh, the UK and at high levels in the charts all across the world. So thank you very much. We do massively appreciate it. This week we're going to be talking all about queuing in, how you can build a brilliant gun dog using your queues. So with me this week is our amazing LWDG group expert, Claire Denya. Claire, how are you this lovely week? I am very well, thank you. The sun is shining, it's beautiful. It's just great to be here to have another really good conversation today. I'm really looking forward to this because I've learned so much about cues working with you over the last however many years we've been dedicated to this. And I think there's some like key points that we're going to touch upon in this episode that maybe people don't really think about but really should be at the forefront of their mind. It goes back to that thing we always say, you don't know what you don't know. And I think this episode will be really interesting for people in highlighting the bits they do need to know around this. So let's start at the beginning. Let me clear, define simply, what is a queue? <laughs> what is a queue? So that's like the big multi-million dollar question, isn't it really? So essentially, and put very simply, a queue is a signal or a word or a phrase or an action that prompts a behavior or an action from your dog that is essentially it in a nutshell I think it's worth just saying not everybody calls them a cue (laughs) and as we were talking before we came on here I think people get very hung up on words and what they mean and they maybe put them into a bracket that maybe isn't really correct so a cue for me is no different to giving my dog a command asking for a behavior because when I give a cue it's not optional it's not me saying to the dog would you like to sit or would you like to come back to me when I call you but I think the word command which I do when I talk I'll be completely honest when I talk the word that comes out of my mouth the most is usually command but that's just because it's what I've been saying for years but now people are calling them cues. Now, essentially, they're not any different. You're asking your dog to do something. But when I say ask, it's not really optional, is it? It's not like you're sitting there saying, would you like to do this? Or would you like to do that? You're just giving the dog a word or a hand signal or a body gesture or a whistle, which is asking the dog to perform an action or behavior for you. Yeah, it's a bit like when your mum says, please, can you do the dishes? If she might have used the word please and suggested it was optional, but it certainly wasn't, was it? No, and it's like when I say thank you to my dog for giving me the retrieve. I'm not really saying thank you, am I? It's just something that comes out of the mouth naturally. So I, so my word when the dog releases the retrieve, the word, the cue that I use is mine. It's just the word I use. Now, I know traditionally a lot of gun dog people use the word dead. Now, the reason I don't use that word is because I do actually teach children and I feel slightly strange saying to the child, say dead. (laughs) So I've just never used it. So I say mine and very often I'll go thank you at the end. So like you said, when you say please when you ask for it, It's just that you're being polite, isn't it? And somehow, because we're human, even though we're having the conversation with the dog, sometimes those words still slip out. (laughs) It's quite funny you said that because the estate agent was here this morning and I said thank you to the dogs for going into the house when we were taking photos in the garden. And he said, oh, I love the fact you tell them thank you. And I'm like, when did I actually start saying that? I think it is like 
a courtesy thing that I've obviously picked up. And just like our dogs have habits, we have habits. We do think they have thin very much the same way don't we and I think with our cues or commands whatever we want to call them the importance of being clear and consistent is incredible isn't it yes it is the importance of being clear and consistent in the words you are using is really important that being said it doesn't really matter what word you use as long as you and your dog are clear on what that word is and you are consistent. But it's like you see this quite often when people maybe have a dog that hasn't yet got a reliable recall. And so they recall the dog and maybe the first or second time that they call the dog, they use the same word. But then the third or fourth time that they call the dog, they maybe change that word or it becomes a sentence or it goes to what's this? And then it becomes, look what I've got. And then the angry voice sets in. <laughs> and before you know it, the recall isn't even a word that is recognised by the dog anymore. And this is what I explain to people that come to me all the time with recall issues is for your dog to understand recall, you need to use that recall word and then be insistent on it and ensure the dog responds to it not then suddenly change the word because otherwise your dog will never learn what that recall word is. They're coming on something completely different, not the word that you're using to recall your dog. So yeah, the consistency in the word and building those behaviours is so important. Our cues are absolutely essential in the fact that they are our sort of unique way of communicating with our dog though aren't they because without those there is no teamwork there is no partnership if you can't have some sort of let's call it a conversation where you both understand what you want as we said before what words you use is completely down to you but they are that form of communication with your dog and so developing those and rewarding those to build on them is so super important we can't press this enough and we talk about it in so many masterclasses and, pod and podcasts is that you are trying to build a behavior so essentially building a cue or command you need to reward it so that the dog starts to value it and understand it because let's face it your dog doesn't speak english but they learn through repetition and through a history of a reward system or through a consequence good or bad they start to learn what that word that cue or command means and what you expect of them in that moment and ultimately from there that becomes rewarding if we're trying to build on it and we're rewarding it so yeah it, it, it's so important let's start with our sort of four foundational cues I say four some of us would argue there's three there which is our our sit or our sit and stay like for, for many of us in our group sit means stay it's no there's not two different things a recall a cam and a leave or a leave it let's talk about these why are they essential they are essential because not just for gun dog work but for your average pet dog owner for your family dog for me the four things that people want and need generally will be a good recall, the dog to sit and wait, like you say, or stay, which we can talk about if you want to get into that one, Joe. the whole debate around that. Leave, because for me, when I train leave, it's trained in a way that means you can't have that, you can't touch that, disengage from it. And also, whatever your word might be that you might use for your dog when they're walking on a lead with you and you don't want them to pull them. So for me, for the average dog, which is still the foundations for building your gum dog work, those are probably the four most important ones. Fit is, is with Sandra, isn't it? It's fit. But I do think if we touch upon it, there's a bit of confusion that a dog that sits down, puts his bum down and then gets up and wanders away, has sat. Whereas in my argument, it should be sit until I ask you to do something else. Yeah, and this comes up all the time. And I have this conversation with nearly every client that I work with as well. Now, the bottom line is it's personal choice what word you use. 
And equally, it very much for me depends on the dog on if I'm just going to use sit or whether I am going to implement another word. Now, that would be dog dependent, not me choosing what I think is right because with the dog in front of you. So if I've got a dog, here's an example. So for me, a trained dog understands that sit means sit until I give you another command or until I release you from that position. But that's a trained dog. Now, puppies have really short attention spans, massively short attention spans, and duration of a sit can be really tricky. And a lot of people, when they're training, let's say things like recall, will often, just through habit, because this was the old style way of teaching it, it's not how I teach it with puppies anymore. So for me, a lot of handlers and a lot of owners will sit the puppy up and recall it. Okay. So if they're doing that, the dog is preempting very often the reward. And the reward in that incident is actually for the recall, not for the sit, because you've rewarded the action of coming out of the sit to you. So if a puppy's really struggling with that, sometimes I will suggest to an owner that for a period of time to help the dog build some stability and some self-control, I might say, do you know what? For this puppy, use the word stay and always go back to the puppy and reward it in the stay before you release it. But later on, when that puppy has got self-control, and I do this with my own dogs, when they've got self-control, sit just means sit. But for puppies, that can be quite a hard concept to grasp, especially if the handler is giving mixed messages by recalling them out of it and rewarding them. So then the dog is confused. It's just sit means sit and not move or just sit means sit and wait a second because I'm going to call you and reward you. So I just think it's personal preference. And I genuinely believe that for a trained adult dog and for a lot of young dogs, sit means sit until further notice. But be open-minded enough to think, if a dog is really struggling with that, can I make this easier for this dog to grasp this by using a different word when I want the dog to remain there and I want to reward them in that position to add duration? It's just something to be open-minded about. And I think that's the... That's the great thing about working with the dog in front of us is we're not saying this is how you must do it. We're saying, here's some options, see what works for you and your dog and go from there. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think your set of cues will change quite, not regularly, but as you learn more, I know for me, as I've learned more, my my repertoire, shall we use that word, very big word there, of cues, has changed to, I've never said stay because dad was a bit of a traditional trainer, sit men sit until I tend to do something else. So I've never used it. But I do hear myself sometimes saying wait. So my wait does become a stay. Certainly with Ella, I give her a sit and then I say wait. So look lady, I know what your next plan is going to be and I'm just giving you advance warning. We're not going there. So that sort of snuck in. And I've also got, because I know that they will go down into a lay down. I've got a settle, which is also a sit. So sit, wait, sit and settle are all pretty much the same thing. That they are given at different points by me, but they're basically all saying, could you just stay where you are, please? Yeah, 100%. That's exactly it. So you've just hit the nail on the head. But that's working within what works for you and for your lifestyle and your dogs and figuring that out. But yeah, for me, I like to just use sit, but if I need to use a stay to help a dog understand better, that means just don't move from that spot because I'm going to come back and reward you in that place. I'll do it. So it's just what works for the dog, what works for you, what works for the family and the household that you're living in. I think that's always got to be considered because especially if there are children in the house, the children are going to use all different kinds of words. They're just going to chat to the dog, right? (laughs) I think when you've got like a family, probably the word that is used the most by all the family isn't one of sit or stay or whatever you want to call it. It's a recall, isn't it? And I think that one has to be universally the same across the family because you've heard it, I've heard it in our households where you have friends. They call him by name. They call him by, come here. They call him by, they call him by a thousand different things. You're like, can you just call 
by one word means just give the dog a chance. What do we say when we are talking about a cam oil recall? So what you just said is so true, Joe, and especially in households where there are adults and children, recall can get really lost for the dog, especially when they're learning it. So having one word that everybody uses for recall is very important. But if you've got children, I'm going to give you a little insider information. Sometimes I will advise the mum or dad to give the children a different word to use to call the dog for the purpose that children aren't going to reinforce it. The child isn't going to ensure it happens if the dog ignores it. So I will say, have another word that's like a casual come here word, not a recall. So your recall means you must come to me immediately, first time, hopefully, into all the way to me. But so that could be the word come, or it could be the word here. And I might say for the children, teach them a different word. So that might be if they're using come as the formal recall or they're using a whistle for the formal recall. I might say, tell the children to say here and coax the puppy in and the puppy will want to come in. But then if the puppy doesn't come in and the children don't enforce that the puppy comes in because they're not going to, no damage is done to the recall. Because that's the most important thing with the recall is your dog doesn't learn that they can ignore the recall. I can't press this enough to people about their training, the recall. So my rule of thumb when I'm educating owners on teaching recall is use the dog's name to get their attention or use a noise to get their attention before you use the recall word. Because otherwise, if you've not got their attention and you start calling them, you start repeating that recall over and over again, and the dog just learns to zone out and not listen to it at all. But for me, that's a massive part of it. Does that make sense, Joe? Yeah. And while you're talking, I'm trying to think now. We've done a podcast before on the importance of being able to use a whistle and how to be able to use your voice when you don't have the whistle. Come here or recall is probably the one where... When I use my voice, I do struggle with, because I've got to be honest, I don't think I've got a word for it because I've always used the whistle. I might use their names, but every time I go to recall my dogs, I automatically now look for my whistle. If it's not in my mouth, I grab my whistle and I pick. And I think that might be a case for you as well. It's the fact that you might find that you're using one thing more than another and, and through no fault of your own, but it still needs to be addressed, you need to have a voice command as well as a whistle command on you. Yeah, you need to have a backup because if like me, I, because I do regularly forget my whistle, I have one in each training vest and a spare one in the car as well. So if I forget to put the main one on my neck when I leave the house, there's probably going to be an option for me because I'm a serial, forget the whistle. So a backup word is important. And actually, when you're working with a puppy in the garden or even in the house and you're firstly conditioning that recall, command you might not want to be blasting your whistle so you tend to start with a verbal but then when you move on to the whistle sometimes you forget what your verbal word is and then anything comes out of the mouth so I will have say rose come or genie come as my verbal but yes when I'm out on the field I am predominantly using my whistle but very often the whistle isn't around my neck when I'm out in the garden and I don't want them learning to ignore the recoil in the garden yeah it, it's definitely worth having a verbal command and a whistle command or cue for your for what you're saying so that if you do forget your whistle, you still have some control over your dog. So important. I probably, as you're talking, I'm trying to think what do I do when they're in the garden. But if I'm calling them in, I probably just use their names. I probably just say Rex, L. And they do come in, to be fair to them, they're straight away. But I wonder as well, and this is where we go back to what we were just saying about the fluidity of your vocabulary. I used to just send on their names. So now I'm like, Joe, try not to use the names unless it's followed by something. So all the time I'm trying to improve my use of cues, my use of commands. So you've got to give us, oh, or we've got to give ourselves some space to know that this is always going to change, isn't it? It's a language. 
It is a language. It really is a language. You're so right. And so here's the thing. The name thing is another thing that comes up in conversation all the time. Now, traditionally, a lot of gum dogs that lived in kennels, so many dogs, so many gum dogs now are pets as well as gum dogs, working dogs. So they're in the home. So my thing with using the name for recall and I suppose even for sending on a retrieve is you're probably going to say your dog's name quite a lot throughout the day and evening in general chit chat because we can't help it which doesn't mean come or doesn't mean go on the retrieve so actually is that is their name a clear indication a clear cue to that dog of the behavior you want possibly not because you're saying it oh rose what are you up to oh genie what are you up to oh, come here, have a cuddle. The name isn't giving them a very solid cue in that scenario. So then is it any surprise that maybe if you're using just the name only on the recall, perhaps the recall's weak because around the house and around the garden, you're saying their name and it doesn't mean come. Is that, it's worth considering these things, being open-minded enough to considering if something's going wrong, really have a think about potentially why that could be, because that could be your reason. So that's why I don't. And it's another reason why my dogs have nicknames in the house. And although they do have nicknames, I still do call them by their actual name quite frequently in the house. So to use their name for a cue or command doesn't sit quite right with me because I'm saying it all the time and not asking for that behaviour. Yeah, absolutely. And when I first had Rex, because he was a kennel dog, like you just touched upon. And because my uncle sent him on his name, picking up dog, he would say his name very calmly, the dog would shoot out. When we first had him, if I called him by his name in the house, he'd shoot to the back door, he'd pass you. He wouldn't even look at you. And I'd be like, what are you doing? And it took me a while to work it out. He was like trying to get out of the house. I don't know why that in his head made sense. I'm supposed he was thinking, I need to get to some type of of grass or area to hunt <laughs> but he would shoot past you he'd, he'd like literally take you out if he could just by his name it's taken us quite a while to get to the point where when you say his name he makes eye contact first to see as if to say yeah what do you know what yeah. I mean? and, and that, yeah. that's been hard for him but you are quite right a kennel dog will not use or have their name used so much and as owners of do a purpose dogs or pet dogs. We need to forgive ourselves, but also remember this when we go to training, don't we? What the trainer might be saying mm -hmm. works brilliantly with their kennel dogs. We might not work in a house. And I think it does depend on how rigid and strict that person is as well, because the trainer may be very capable of ensuring they don't use the dog's name inappropriately so that it weaken the dog's name, meaning the recall or meaning the send on a retrieve. Whereas for a lot of households, absolutely think of it, think of a house with children, how many times the children are going to be saying the dog's name over and over again. And again, this is where a nickname can become very useful because you can squash that a little bit, but still the dog's name is the dog's name. So I think it is just being, for me as a trainer, I have to think about what is going to work. It's not about what I teach and how I teach it, and it has to be done this way. It's about, okay, so this is generally what I do, but sometimes we might do this because of this. But in your case, maybe actually we'll do that instead because it's not going to work for you in your household. So it's being adaptive enough, I think that's the right word, to think like that and to think, how can this work for this family? Instead of just being hung up on, this is the traditional word, so this is what you're going to do. Yeah, because going back to the picking up, if you've got a picking up team of, I don't know, six or seven, and they're kept in kennels, it makes absolute sense to use the name as a send out because no other dog moves. It literally is a very distinct name for every single dog. Again, it's working with the dog in front of you, but also working in the situation you and your dog are going to find yourself in all the most. I can also remember my dad telling me, don't pick a name for a pup that's similar 
to another dog. So for example, if you've got a buddy, don't then have something that's like that dirt sound. So you're looking for something slightly different. And, and if you're adding to your pack, you want to be thinking about things like that. What am I saying to this one? How is it different to that one? A hundred percent. And actually this recently happened to us. So we had Indy, bless her soul, he's no longer with us. Dude sounds nothing like Indy. Rose. Sounds nothing like dude or indie. But then we recently bought Jeannie home. Now, Jeannie does sound a bit like indie. She was 12 and she was going deaf and she had mild dementia as well. And bless her heart, she started looking to me when I was saying Jeannie because to her, because she was going deaf, it sounded very similar. And I didn't even twig until it was too late. And I was like, oh, <laughs> So yeah, that definitely is worth some food for thought because she definitely was looking to respond at the name Genie because it does sound like Indy. I think as well, this we as humans, also because we're curious little monkeys, we get in inquisitive when somebody calls anybody else's name, don't they? If Matt calls Meg's name, I'm like, what does he want Meg for? Is it he's been to the shop and he's got sweeties? Is it in which case I'm in? Is he going to give her a chore? In which case I'm out? And I think our dogs are very much the same. They might not respond to their name, but they're still very interested in why you're calling that name. Yes, they're very interested in why you're calling that name. So yeah, I think there is an inquisitiveness about it as well. And especially if it's just they've heard the tail end of it and they're like, oh, was that for me? <laughs> so... Going, we've covered quite a lot of the key challenges that you will probably face with teaching your dog the foundations. One of the things I want to sort of loop back to is when we said the words, it's important to teach, leave it. Leave it is like your, not get out of jail free card, but it's the word where you want your dog to know so that the dog doesn't get itself in trouble, isn't it? Yeah, and, and this comes up as a topic quite a lot on the society group as well, doesn't it? And people asking questions because for me, I think it depends how you teach leave. For me, as a behavioural trainer, as well as a gun dog trainer, leave means disengage from the thing. You can't have it, move away from it, step away from it. And I teach the dog that it's in their best interest and of their benefit to avoid that thing. So if you teach that really solidly, and I think this is a really important thing to remember, if you teach that really solidly, you don't want to dilute it. So you could easily dilute it by using the word leave in your steadiness training. So let's just say you put your dog in a sit and you've thrown a dummy out and you say leave. And then 10 seconds later, you send them for that retrieve that no longer is a leave that leave has become a pause button a precursor for something else if for me when I'm teaching if I'm working with a client and we've trained a solid leave as in a disengagement leave and the dog has a super leave I will say to them it would probably be beneficial to not use the word leave in your steadiness training or around your retrieve training or around anything where you're going to then let the dog have the thing because you're going to weaken it. It no longer means you can't have it. It suddenly means it's a pause button. Now, that very much stands for a young dog or a dog that has behavioral things happening or a dog where perhaps you've used the leave word to stop them digesting things that could be potentially dangerous and harmful or inappropriately interacting with other people or dogs, anything like that. Later on, if you're working with a trained dog, if you were to say leave to a dummy and send them, probably if you haven't got behavior stuff going on, probably, and I'm going to say probably because this will be very dog dependent, your dog might start to discriminate and you might get away with it. But I always want to wear on the side of caution. So I don't use my trained leave command in steadiness or retrieve training. So what I'll do is I'll reinforce what I do want the dog to do. So I'll repeat the word sit or whatever it is or heal because it's like, this is what I do want you to do. So unless I've sent you for the thing, you can't go get the thing. So it's quite simple, really. 
because if we dilute it and the the handler or owner is using that trained leave in a behavioural manner, diluting it is going to be detrimental to their life with the dog. So take retrieving and steadiness out of it. That's gun dog skills. So that's completely different. I'm talking here about a leave that helps the family control and manage their dog. Now, as a little caveat on that, if you've got a super sensitive dog that you're working with and they have a really good leave and you then throw a dummy out and say leave and then did send them for that retrieve, that dog might not pick that retrieve up because they're super sensitive and their leave is so well conditioned that they go, hang on a minute, you said no, you said leave, I can't pick that up. So there's two sides to this. You could either weaken your leave or you could potentially have a dog that then wouldn't want to pick the thing up because you said leave. Now, there is a little twist to this. So recently-ish, it came into the working test world for retrievers working tests that if there were multiple options of retrieve out there, you are now allowed to say, leave that or leave it to one retrieve and then point in the direction of the other one. But as I say, that's very different. That's just looking at a gun dog scenario for working tests, not taking into account behavior. So I think you have to think about what leave means for you and your dog to be able to decipher and decide whether and how you're gonna use it. So I didn't know about this leave it within the working test scenario. Out of curiosity, is leave it the only word they will allow you to use to indicate not to go after that dummy? I believe if you were to use a different word, you may lose a point or two. But hey. <laughs> it, it, is um, quite, it is quite interesting, though, because I'm working really hard to stop saying leave it. And we, I think sometimes the stuff we, we taught right at the beginning is the harder stuff to, mm -hmm. to unlearn. So for me, like dad always used to say, dead, gone away, leave it. There were certain things. So I'm trying now, instead of saying leave it, to say gone away, even I'm probably not using gone away completely in the right situation. I'm using gone away more as a pause and I'll leave it as a leave it. But it is incredibly hard. So when maybe then competing, we have to know what we can and can't say because we need to have those habits, don't we? Yeah, I think the bottom line is most of the dogs that are competing at that level where that sort of thing's going to matter, they're probably not going to have the behavioural problems that require that trained lead command. So again, this goes back to, is your dog a family dog, a pet? Have you got behavioural stuff going on? Or is your dog a kennel dog or a dog with that lives in the home but generally has really good life skills? and you're competing with it. Again, this is where it comes down to the dog in front of you, the family you're working with, the handler and their needs and what they need out of it. So this is why I did find a way around this. This is why I teach my dogs so much with body language, because if I actively turn my body away from one dummy to face the other, that in itself is a very clear indication to my dog I don't want that one. I physically turned you and myself away from it and I'm lining you for that one. For me, it doesn't matter. I can still use my lead as a trained lead because I know that my dog understands the body language that tells my dog, I don't want that one, I want that one. Which body language is a huge part of the cues that we give the dog anyway. For society members, don't worry, I'm already asking her for an advanced masterclass on subtleties of body movement whilst working out in the field. <laughs> I'm sure Claire will have it with us before we even know about it. So, Great job. <laughs> okay, so we've gone over the importance of clear and consistent cues in our gun dog training. We've talked quite a lot about building a strong cue foundation for our dogs. Obviously, our society members have loads of stuff within their membership on their dashboards in their study hubs that are there for further learning on this subject. We also have coming up on the 19th of August, we have our five-day free challenge for the K9Q Academy. For anybody who's interested in working with myself and with Claire on building solid cues, 
you can join us so every single day for 30 minutes a day where we're going to look at things that you need for expert guidance, practical solutions and personal growth around using your cues. To sign up to be part of the K9Q Academy, please go to www.ladiesworkingdoggroup.com forward slash K9Q. That's forward slash K9Q. Register, sign up there and you'll be sent all the information to join us for that. Is there anything else we want to touch upon now, Claire, before we close up what has been yet again another amazing podcast? I think just remember, I don't think we already said this, but just remember that your cues or commands aren't just verbal or whistle. They're also body language, which does tie in with what I just said about the body language setting your dog on a retreat. And we know that dogs read our body language far better than they understand words. And so what I see very often is if a handler who is very novice to the gun dog training and maybe is introducing new cues and commands like your lefts, your rights and your backs, and that is a combination of body language and a verbal cue, very often what you'll see is that the handler may stumble on the word that comes out. But because the body language has been so clear, the dog gets it right anyway. So I think it's just worth touching on. Although having clear and consistent cues and commands for your dogs is really super important because it is. Don't forget the massive part that your body language and the physical cues and commands that you give, the impact that they also have on your dog. Yeah, absolutely. For those who are like myself and like some other ladies, when you get plus 40 and you start forgetting everything, you do have the magic month planners, okay? They have your cues inside plus space to write your own cues each month where you can remember what it was exactly you were trying to teach last month and keep you online. Make sure, like Claire said, avoid technical jargon, use clear language, be concise with your dogs. We've covered loads of real life examples there to illustrate those points. So hopefully that we've really had you nail that idea in your head. Now, if you have any questions, any replies, please send them to us via social media at Ladies Working Dogs or Ladies Working Dog Group on Facebook. Please make sure to review and subscribe and we look forward to speaking to you all next week about another fabulous topic. That's all for now. Goodbye. That's it for today's episode. A massive thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to head over to the LWDG and sign up for our membership. Get access to expert-led training, a wonderfully supportive community and the resources you need to become a confident and skilled gun dog trainer. Let's take this journey together because no woman should have to train her gun dog alone. We'll see you all next week.